Welcome to the Eye on Foxborough podcast. I'm Karen Garigian, and today I'm pleased to welcome Jeff Benedict, a best-selling author of 17 nonfiction books, including The Dynasty, which takes a behind-the-scenes look at the New England Patriots, and in his words, the nucleus of the greatest sports dynasty of the modern era in Robert Kraft, Bill Belichick, and Tom Brady. The book is the basis for the upcoming 10-part docuseries, which starts Friday on Apple TV+. Plus. Welcome, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well, Karen. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Are you, are you looking forward to this thing finally launching and viewers can take a peek at how your book comes alive <laughs> in a docuseries? I am. I really am. It's been a... Um... You know, getting to write the book was a, a dream of mine. It really was. And it was uh, it was not an easy dream to to realize. And um, and then once I got into the book, it was pretty early on in the process that I thought, you know, this would make a great unscripted television series. And I started thinking about how to do it while I was writing the book. And then the, you know, then it went really full bore. As soon as I turned the manuscript in, I had about, I turned the manuscript in right after Tom Brady informed uh, Robert Kraft that he was leaving. And uh, so I had a window between then and the fall before the book actually went on sale. And during that time, I was pretty much solely dedicated to figuring out how to get this turned into a documentary series. Mm. I know you're not at liberty to discuss really any specifics of the episodes in the docu series since it hasn't aired yet. Um, so let's let's talk about the book. Um, I it's funny I reviewed it a while back, um, and it was hard not to be gripped for me anyway right away by the prologue, uh, which vi vividly described the scene in 2001 with Drew Bledsoe being rushed to the hospital with a partially severed artery. Uh, and in his hospital room, his wife Maura was there along with Kraft, Belichick and Brady. They were all huddled around him. Um, from there, you start with Brady's departure in, in a chapter called The End Game. Uh, and then you trace backwards from there, uh, from Kraft's purchase of the team, landing Belichick, all the winning and everything that's happened over the course of uh, several decades. I mean, you literally take us into Robert Kraft's living room <laughs> uh, when Brady was there to say goodbye. Um, in my review, I said you were like a fly on the wall or a fly on the wall that like everyone would want to be in the places that you were, what kind of access did you have in terms of writing the book? Um, so that's a great question. I had, um, well, as you know, the majority of the book, in other words, the first 18 years of the dynasty took place before I arrived in Foxborough. The last two years of the dynasty took place. I witnessed in real time because I was inside at that point. So all the scenes that take place after the summer of 18, I witnessed. And so you you made a reference at the beginning. You, you said two things. The hospital scene where Drew Bledsoe, uh, you know, literally goes under the knife. Um, that happens in September of 2001. I obviously was not there for that. And so in order to versus the next where you turn the page and there's a scene that's set in current time. And Tom Brady is alone in his suite at Gillette Stadium, looking out at an empty stadium. Yep. I was there for that. So technically he wasn't alone, but mm -hmm. for purposes of writing, he was alone because I was there as an observer. And, and so I, there's two completely different sets of tools you have to use to write those two scenes. Because in the end, you want those two scenes to feel the same to the reader, which is as if they are there. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing you have to do is you want to make the writer be invisible because this is not about the writer. 
it's never about the writer. It's always about the character. Who are the characters? In that first sequence, you have all the main characters that are going to carry the story. You have Robert, you have Bill, and you have Tom standing over Drew's hospital bed, which is a great way to signal to the reader, here's where we're going. Mm -hmm. This is where we're going. Come along. In order for that to work, the, the two most important people in that sequence are none of them are Tom, Bill, or Robert. And it's certainly not Drew, who was under the influence of a narcotic that was designed to numb pain so he could have the procedure done. So he's not very reliable for an interview about what went on in the hospital room. The two most important people are the surgeon and Drew's wife. Yeah. Two people who had never been interviewed about anything that had anything to do with that. And in the case of the surgeon, he can't talk about any of that because of HIPAA. And so one of the things you got to figure out is how can you get the doctor to talk? Because if you can, that opens up a, a scene that is going to be marvelous, whether you're a Patriots fan or not, and it's just going to pull everybody in. And so I spent a lot of time working through the legal part of getting permission for the surgeon to talk hmm. for the book and um, and did that. For the Tom scene in the suite, that was me with Tom. And that happened because I asked him a question in my in this first interview with him. I asked him to look out because we were in the suite. He's usually on the field. His family's in the suite watching him. And I was just thinking it's I had been sitting in his suite for three hours before he got there. And I was just I had 25 questions that I, I spent 20 eight hours working on those questions. And I asked Stacey James for special permission on the day of the interview. I said, "Can is there any chance I could go in Tom's suite three hours early? I remember Stacey's like, three hours? I was like, yes. I want to sit in there and I just want to, I, I want to get ready for this interview. And mm -hmm. Stacey brought me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'll never forget that. And <laughs> But when, when I was sitting there alone, I'm looking out and I was thinking, this is going to be a completely different perspective for Tom Brady. He's never up here. He's not a fan. Mm -hmm. he, he never sees the game the way a fan does. He sees it through the eyes of a quarterback. What's it going to be like for him when he steps into this room and looks out the windows at the empty stadium? What is he going to think? Plus, it's, it's near the end of his career. And so I asked him that question, and then he thought out loud. And that's what enabled me to tell you what Tom Brady was thinking. I know what he was thinking because I was there and I was listening to him process his thoughts. Mm. Uh, just so our, our viewers know, Stacey James is the vice president of uh, media relations, just to identify him. What, uh, over the course of the several years you had the, the inside access what struck you most about each of those main characters, whether it was Robert Kraft, Bill Belichick, or Tom Brady? What's your biggest takeaway from each one of those pivotal characters? There are three really complex men, and they're really different people. In the case of like Tom, he actually comes from a different generation. Then, then Robert, by far, that's the biggest age gap, right? Robert's in his 80s, Tom's in his 40s. So there's some obvious differences you look at like that. But <clears throat> what I was zeroing in on, and because I found it fascinating, and there's a reason why I, I don't usually make predictions, mm -hmm. but I'm really comfortable saying that it's so unlikely that we'll ever witness the kind of dynastic run we saw in New England, partly because of the magical combination of three guys who all were vastly underestimated. At so many different points of their life, they were underestimated. Robert as a student, Robert as a business college student, Robert as a young businessman, Robert as an, a new owner in the NFL, at each step of the way, vastly underestimated, which was so much to his advantage. Mm. 
but also drove him. Bill was underestimated constantly. When he came to New England, nobody thought he was suitable head coach material. There were only two people, two, who thought he was, Robert and Bill Parcells. No one else believed in him as a head coach. And then there's Tom, and we all know his underestimation story. And Tom loves that. He keeps that mounted chip on his shoulder his whole career. And I think that that they work together so well because of that common bond that they had that they were underestimated all the time. And then the unique drive they have. Um, I'm sorry, but I love Andy Reid. Love him as a coach. Love him as a guy. Um, supremely entertained by Patrick Mahomes. But honestly, for, for Patrick Mahomes and, and Andy Reid to get where Tom and Bill went, think about it. They're like a quarter of the way down the journey. Yes. A quarter of the way down the journey. It's such a long, long road. And I just, the chances of anybody actually lasting that long, it's just, it's remote. You know, a full disclosure, uh, I was one of those non-believers. Uh, I wrote uh, right after Robert surrendered the first round pick. I didn't understand it. You know, I thought, are you bringing in Vince Lombardi? Are you bringing, you know, <laughs> you know, what was, what did Belichick have that was show us that was worthy of giving up a first round pick? So I yeah. wrote it. I'm now in a book of, you know, dumbest takes uh, <laughs> forever. Uh, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> I love the thread about uh, them being underestimated. But I'd like to ask you, you know, they kept it together for 20 years. And I I'm just curious why you think they were a able to kind of keep the marriage together, the three-way marriage together that long. You know, um, I I've heard some other uh, people weigh in on that question and like be way away from, I think, where the answer lies. And I'm not talking about people in the Boston area who've been around this story forever, like you and Tom Curran and people like that, but outsiders. If you If you really look at it, to me, it's pretty simple. It really is. Is that you start out with a coach who had the foresight and the courage to recognize that there was something different about Tom Brady and he latched onto it and he had the courage to put his career on the line and back Tom when everyone else in his job would have stuck with Drew because Drew was the million dollar man, hundred million dollar man. That Bill deserves all the credit for that. Robert deserves all the credit for not questioning Bill. Now, it doesn't mean he didn't think about it. Didn't mean he didn't question his own mind, but he backed the coach. He allowed Bill to make that decision. There, are, I, I don't know any other owner that would have had the discipline to do that. And then you got Tom, who recognizes that the coach has risked everything by putting his belief in him. And Tom's the kind of guy that when you show him loyalty, he's loyal. And so that's how it starts. And 10 years go by and they do a lot of winning, a lot of winning and they pile up trophies. And, and then they've reached that point where as the three previous NFL dynasties have, they should have broke apart right around 2010. It should have been over. Tom misses the whole 08 season with a, with an injury Guys don't usually come back from that kind of injury, not at his age. There was all kinds of data out there. Brett Favre, Joe Montana, Steve Young, Dan Marino, John Elway, all those guys. You could look at when their career started to go down. And Tom was approaching that. And they'd won three times already and had the almost perfect season. It should have ended there. This is where the role of the owner becomes actually monumental. Because the second half of the dynasty, the thing that separates this dynasty from the Packers of the 60s, the Steelers of the 70s, and the Niners of the 80s and early 90s is the role of the owner on the back half. Tom and Bill get three more Super Bowls together because they have an owner that knows how to keep them together. Um, 
Bill would have moved on sooner. I mean, he he drafted Jimmy Garoppolo. And it makes perfect sense that he drafted Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, when you looked at the things that Bill said at the time, look at Tom's age, look at his contract situation, look look where we are in time. Of course, we need to start, start thinking about a succession plan. So I'm not criticizing what Bill was doing. I'm saying, I think anybody would have done that. But here's the thing, Tom isn't anybody. In other words, there's nobody like Tom. And I think that's why the, the role of the owner becomes unusually outsized here, but yet invisible. Mm. What Robert was doing with Bill and Tom for the last 10 years, but especially from 14, when Jimmy gets there, from 14 to March of 2020, those six years, three more Super Bowls. And I'm saying they don't happen if it's not for the diplomacy of an owner who knows how to work with Bill and be respectful of the lane that the coach has and work with not only the biggest star in the Patriots, but the biggest star in the NFL. And I think that that's why um, the best thing that I learned from Rupert Murdoch was when I interviewed Rupert for the book, he told me, you know, he said, if Robert Kraft had, with his great Australian accent, you know, if Robert, if Robert had gone into uh, politics, he would have gone down in history as one of the greatest diplomats in American history. But he chose a different business. He went into sports. And Rupert was speaking from experience. He knows about the difficulty. I mean, he runs Fox. He's got all these big egos and big personalities. He's very familiar with the space that Robert was in. And I think there's a lot of, of wisdom in what Murdoch is talking about. Mm. You know, it's, I think the, the book came out in 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, it's four years later. Uh, not only is Brady gone, but Belichick as yes. well. Um, knowing what you know, now uh were you surprised how quickly you know the patriots fell off the map following brady's departure um and i'll i'll let you answer that before i ask the next one um i don't know i hadn't really thought about if i'm surprised at how fast they fell off i think probably none of us should be in the sense that you're taking the greatest quarterback of all time off your team at a time when the position of the quarterback is more vital than it's ever been in the game. Mm -hmm. And so it shouldn't be surprising that when you remove that guy from the chessboard, the, the, the whole game is going to change for the Patriots. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how do you replace that? You know, um, when Patrick Mahomes leaves the chiefs, are they going to fall off? Probably. Probably big time. And so I don't think that's, I, I don't necessarily think that's very surprising. No. Mm. Do you think it's unfair how much people now are saying that the, the dynasty was mostly Brady as opposed to, you know, kind of, they're kind of leaving Belichick <laughs> out the door, yeah. given how he's done without Brady. Do you think that's a fair narrative or, or not? I mean, what I would say about that is I think it's a, it's a, oversimplification uh, football football is not like the nba where you really can dominate with it with it. if you have the most dominant player jordan lebron you, you can take over it's a lot harder in football you, you know you got 22 men on the field at a time and so i i think that the reason the dynasty was so dominant was because of the partnership between Bill and Tom. And this is not me being diplomatic. I mean it. I'm saying that in the first 10 years, Bill was an incredible mentor. He taught Tom the game. I'm not telling him to teach him how to play football. Tom knew how to play football. Bill didn't tell him how to throw a football. He, he taught him how to be a winner. He taught him what it takes to win championships, not once, but again and again and again. It's work ethic. It's preparation. It's minimizing mistakes. I mean, that's the first half of the dynasty. I think Bill deserves a ton of credit for that. Mm -hmm. On the back half of the dynasty, I think Tom is at that point, he is now a complete outlier. 
he can do anything on the field. He is now like Michael Jordan on the basketball court. He can control a game. We saw that in the Atlanta Super Bowl. This is a guy who literally does something that no one else can do. He's that good. And by the time you get to the Seattle Super Bowl and the Falcon Super Bowl, he's that guy. In other words, he doesn't need as much of what Bill gave him in 01 and 02 and 03 and 04 and 05 and 06 and 07. Tom is now doing things that are like ethereal. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and I think that, and so it it really is combination. It's it, the fact that they, if they weren't together, neither of them would have won six. There's no way. It, it's the, that's what's so good about it, right? It's It's the combination. And again, I'm not trying to be diplomatic. I, I, that is really what I believe is it's what I see. It is that. Look, players play. And Bill says this when he will talk about it. Coaches coach, players play. You have to. Tom, <laughs> Tom went down to Tampa Bay and won a Super Bowl, and he wasn't playing for Bill Belichick down there, right? He he was playing for a coach whose accomplishments aren't even in the same hemisphere as Bill Belichick's. And Tom went down there because he's that excellent. And he got a group of guys around them and never won anything. And he took them to the promised land. And he didn't one season. I mean, that's, I believe, if he stayed in New England for those last three years and they continued to surround him with the kind of people he had in 14, 15, and 17, 18, they would have won at least one more in New England. I mean, that's unfortunate. That didn't happen. But yeah, yeah. That, for whatever reason, uh, Coach Belichick, well, I mean, they struck out with some of the people that they, you know, the Antonio Browns of the world and trying to outfit Tom, but he still didn't quite have enough. Right. And it's just my personal feeling that I think when Tom hit that age, you know, around 40, I think he became aware or more cognizant of the fact that he couldn't carry a team by himself. He, this is when he really needed the help and he wasn't yeah. getting it. So, yeah. And I think too, Karen, the, th the reason I like this so much, the, the, the reason I was, I loved writing this story so much and turning it into a docuseries, we get to see people evolve. I mean, in the case of Tom, like if you go back to that first scene in the book that you referenced at the beginning of this interview, when Tom's looking out at the empty stadium and he knows his time is, is nearing the end in Foxborough. It's also a moment of reflection. Like he's not a boy anymore. He's a fully developed man. He is, as Tom Wolf would say, a man in full at this point. He, he's a father, he's a husband, he's raising kids. He owns a business. He's the CEO of a company. He's a brand and he's the most successful player in the NFL. He's all of these things. He is much more, of a fully rounded human being than he was when he arrived in Foxborough. When he arrived in Foxborough, he needed a lot more. Now, in 2018, 19, 20, the things he needs are different. Mm -hmm. And part of that is the, you know, just the maturity of life. I mean, I, I just think that that it's similar to when Bill and Robert said goodbye a couple weeks ago. It's like the time had come. To me, it's not like, well, why did they break up? No, that's not the right question. The question is, how did they stay together so long? <laughs> that's really the question. Um, I'm tempted to ask you if if you're going to write an addendum to the book with with Belichick's departure. But in your mind, did the dynasty end when Brady walked out, out the door, or has yes. the dynasty now yes. ended? So no. Belichick is just an addendum after the fact. Well, it's, it's not that it's he's just an addendum and certainly wouldn't say either he or Robert were just addendums. It's just that the dynasty is the foundation of the dynasty is a trilogy. It's three people. It's the owner, the quarterback and the and the head coach. I would say the same thing about the 49ers dynasty. It was DeBartlo. It was Walsh. It was Montana with the Steelers. It was Rooney. It was Noel. It was Bradshaw. Same with the Packers, Lombardi, Star. When you break that up, it's over. Yeah. I mean, it's over. And so, yeah, when Tom left, the, the, the dynasty was, that doesn't mean that, that they can't keep winning and all that kind of stuff I'm saying, but that dynasty ended when Tom leaves, When he, which is why I would not do an addendum to the book, because when Tom walked away, 
that was a perfect ending. Hmm. Uh, the mutual parting that happened between Belichick and, and Mr. Kraft. Yeah. Uh, they were friendly. They made it seem like it was friendly. Do you think it was that friendly? I think, look, I've said this all along and I'll, I'll say it again. When you have the kind of length that these three men had in their business relationship, there are stress fractures along the way and they had them. Was there tension? Yes. Of course there were. Were there disagreements? Of course there were. Anything that you look at that involves greatness and building, and it's why I made the comparison between Lennon and McCartney and, and Bill and Tom. I chose that comparison for a reason, because the Beatles represent the best of rock and roll music ever. They'll never be surpassed. But we know what the creative relationship between John and Paul was like, especially at the end. And that's what I would compare this to. And naturally, when you get away from it, I mean, when Paul talks about John now, it's with wonderful fondness. That's not surprising. And it's also not disingenuous. And I think with, with these guys, it is like that. In the moment, it's difficult. It is tense. These are men with passion. They're, they're men that are incredibly competitive, and I think what was amazing is that they never allowed differences of opinion to ever get in the way of what they did on the field. And that's why they won so much. And so, yeah, I thought what you saw at the press conference, look, Bill's not a good actor. <laughs> He's just not. Mm -hmm. Bill's not good at faking. And I think what you saw there is after all these two, the owner and the coach had been through, is that in the end, they did what Bill predicted they might do when he first got there. And he gave Robert that picture of Babe Ruth and Ted Williams and said, maybe we could be successful as these two fellas. Well, those two fellas did that. As crazy as that sounded when Bill wrote that note, they actually did that. Like, that's insane when you think about it. They actually pulled that off. And um, so, yeah, I think what you saw was genuine. Um. Along with being the author of the book, you are the executive producer for the docuseries, which again begins tomorrow uh, on Apple Plus TV. Um, can you talk just a bit about how, trying to put that all together? You know, how'd you come up with 10 parts? <laughs> and, you know, and then how did you gather all the people for all the, the, the on-screen interviewing that was done? Um, writing a book is very different than producing a 10 part documentary series. Mm -hmm. Writing a book is a very independent project. You, you work alone and it's actually lonely. You know, I spent a lot of time by myself when I'm writing a book, when you're making a documentary series, it is the opposite of that. It, there's a massive team of people. We looked at tens of thousands of hours of archival footage. I didn't look at it. The director didn't look at it. We looked at some of it, but there's a whole team of people on the production that that's all they did. It's just massive. Editors, storytellers, cinematographers, all kinds of people. And so it it, it is a team effort. But at the, the, the end of the day, like the idea to do it was something that I was thinking about while I was writing the book. It was something I wanted to do while I was writing the book and something I laid the groundwork for before I finished writing. And as soon as I finished writing, I went to work on it. And I, I knew who I wanted to be involved in directing it. Um, Matt Hamachek, uh, I had worked with him on the Tiger Woods adaptation of my book into a documentary for HBO. I thought his storytelling skills, not that, not that I'm some great like, filmmaking expert here, I'm not, but I had certainly seen what he was capable of doing and I, I, I really wanted to work with someone as a, to direct it that didn't look at this as a football story because I knew that's what Apple TV Plus wanted. When we pitched this to Apple, they, they, there were people on the Apple call when we pitched it. They literally didn't know who Bill Belichick was. Yeah. I mean, imagine that. They, they, who? I mean, they knew who Tom Brady was, but they didn't, they didn't care about the Patriots. Um, this is a global audience. They're in every country. And most of the people watching their platform may not be football fans. And so that's what I was looking for in a director. And I think, you know, we had a wonderful time piecing this thing together. Um, 
bringing this to television and allowing you, this is a different medium. You, you do different things when you're storytelling on television because you actually get to see these people. Was it tough deciding on like what content had to be in and what was on the cutting room floor from, from the book? Was that a hard process to, you know, navigate through? I mean, that that is done more by, you know, ultimately the cutting is suggested by editors and the director. Part of that is dictated, though, by what you have. And so um, archival footage affects that a lot. What do we have in archival tape? that? Because with a film, you have to show everything. With a book, there are no pictures in the book, not one. And so not even on the cover, it's just a helmet. And so you are you need pictures to show what the documentary is saying. And so that dictates it. But I would say by and large, no, it wasn't hard. Uh, the editing process is hard just because it's a sophisticated, complicated process. And we were fortunate to have really, really good editors and storytellers who were working on this. And um, many of whom weren't Patriots fans, and uh, but they were enthralled with what we were doing. Just a couple more quick questions. I know our, our time is running out a little bit. Um, the, I've, the trailer has come out, or we've yes. seen one trailer, um, and it, it does invite you in. Uh, you, it, with people like Danny Amendola saying, "We worked for Bill, but we played for Tom." Uh, Randy Moss describing a scene where Bill completely takes Brady's head off. Were you? kind of pleasantly surprised at the openness uh, by, you know, some of the players in general and what, you know, what they gave you for, for the, for the series. What, what I found that happens is when you write a book first and then the book becomes the basis of a film, the book gives you an opportunity to not only build trust, but prove trust. So when the book comes out, everybody in the book is holding their breath. Mm -hmm. What's it going to say? How's it going to make me look? Um, and if you do your job properly and you, you're you honest with people and um, you treat people right, the book comes out and everybody goes, mm -hmm. it's like dodging a bullet. Mm -hmm. And then you find out there's things that they held back when you interviewed them for the book because they weren't really sure, you know, and now they've read the book and they go, okay, now I'm, I trust more. And so we saw that in the tiger project, we went deep in the tiger biography deep, but then we did the documentary and there were some people who went deeper and there were some people who chose not to participate in the book because they were afraid or they were not sure. And then they decided to participate in the doc because now they felt more comfortable. And so that's a that's one of the benefits or beauties of being able to do this is it's a continuation of the story. It's a deepening of the story um, because these relationships have been established and you bring in a new storyteller who has his lens and it just, it elevates it. I see you wearing a Rolling Stone shirt, and I know that they're coming to Fox Pro. Is there a story behind that? <laughs> well, we were talking off the air before, and I, I was just thinking that um, there have been a lot of great moments working on this docuseries, a lot of great moments. And um, some of them didn't necessarily have to do with the quote-unquote making of the docuseries, but one of the things that... Uh, uh, Matt Hamachek and I uh, got to do, which was terrific. Um, working with him was 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 really fun, but uh, we got to uh, we were working at the stadium on the series when the the Stones came to the stadium and did a private show mm. um, at the stadium in a tent. And uh, I, I am a I can't overemphasize how big of a fan I am of their music and have been forever. And to be in that small of a space and to get like within eight feet of Mick Jagger um, with my cell phone uh, <laughs> was I, I don't need to go to any more Rolling Stones concerts because it's hard to beat that. And uh, that happened while we were making the docuseries. So 
uh, pretty good moment. I'll bet there were a few other too, but uh, I want to thank you, Jeff, uh, so much for taking the time uh, for the Eye on Foxborough podcast. And we're all looking forward to the docu series, which starts tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Karen.